Hi guys, it is week two, so let's go into the workshop, see what's going on with Aurora. We picked up Aurora brand new in 2019 from the factory. The plan was to put our boat on a charter program to help with the costs in keeping her. But after a grounding in July 2020, she has been on the hard ever since. It's now 2021 and things are looking up as Aurora is going into the workshop to be made strong again. Join me as I follow the guys at Plaskorder and Montage and learn just how this type of repair is done by the professionals. Yo, Patrick! <laughs> Welcome back aboard Aurora. Patrick's just finished up for the day. He's been through exactly what he's been uh, working on over the last few days. So let me try and convey that to you um, in the way that I know how. Let me start by telling you a little story about production boats, actually. Um, I'm not an expert on this, but I do know a few things now and what I've picked up over the last uh, couple of years and whatever, and, and the research I did before buying a boat. Hansa state that the bulkheads on the boats are laminated, uh, which is fine, and, and that the bulkheads uh, give the boat a lot of strength as well. But um, what the core strength of the boat is, is this grid. This grid uh, gives all the strength to the, um, to the structure around the keel, and especially when you have a grounding, what will happen is the keel will try and push up here and this is where the majority of the strength needs to be on the grid here. There's two ways of doing this grid, right? One way you can do it is to fully laminate the grid into the hull, um, which is the most time-consuming way, but it's also the best and the strongest way of doing it. Now, lately, production boats have gone away in which they're um, putting bonder down in between the grid, and uh, this is the bonder, this gray stuff here, they're putting this stuff down in between the grid and the hull. And although this works, um, the problem is that it's, it's not as strong and it's very brittle as well. In the last episode I showed you that you can, just, you can just chip that away with a hammer. So you can imagine as soon as you get an impact like this, um, it's very prone to cracking and breaking because of the brittleness uh, of the um, bonder in there. And this was something that I was fully aware of when I was buying a production boat, actually. Um, I knew that many of the costs have been cut. If you take like the difference between a Halberg Rassi and a Bento and a Genoa and a Hansa and whatever, the price difference is a lot different, actually. It's, it's close to double, I think, when you pay for a hand-built boat and when you pay for a production boat. And when you start to look around the boat, you realize that actually all of the gear is more or less the same. You know, the mast, uh, the mast and rigging and everything like that, that's the same. Most of the time it's made by Selden. Um, the keels, okay, the, the keel is a keel. Uh, the windlasses, they're all more or less running the same gear. Maybe slightly better, maybe slightly worse, but there's not that much difference in it. All the electronics, they're gonna have the same uh, electronics, B&G, Raymarine, all those kind of things, right? So those costs are more or less the same. When it comes to the build, your money when you're buying a boat is being put into the time spent building the boat itself, the labor time, right? And the quicker they can build the boats, the more money the production boat company is gonna save. And this is where they save money here. Okay, it takes more time to laminate this uh, grid in than it does to put bonder all underneath the grid and just drop it down into hull, the hull. That's way faster to produce the boats that way. And this is something that a lot of people are willing to accept, me included. Um, it's, the, it's the new way of building boats, but unfortunately when you get complications like this, you notice the downfalls as well. Anyway, just, just food for thought. Back to the repair. There's four holes that have been cut in the grid there so that uh, Nicholas can access um, in and underneath the grid there 
to start laminating the whole grid down. Now, it's important to mention actually that when Plascoda repair this, they're actually going to laminate the grid down to the hull, uh, which makes it much stronger and um, yeah, it's going to be a better boat after the repair, which I'm super happy about. We were just talking about the keel bolts as well and the way that that will be repaired and what happens is the keel is um, brought up and made sure that it's in line and then basically taken down again and what they'll do is they'll put Secaflex on all of the top of the keel and put the keel up and then fill the area with uh, a special compound, I'll find out what it is later, um, mixed with uh, bits of fiberglass so it makes it very strongly bonded into the bottom of the hull there. So Patrick's also gone ahead and grinded off all of the uh, top of the gel coat over the grid there as well. So what can happen later on also is that um, fiberglass can be laid right the way over the grid, uh, making it like sort of wrapped in fiberglass down to the hull. So it makes it a very, very solid piece of construction there uh, just behind the keel and um, in this area. So you can see on the video here that the uh, random orbital sander makes pretty short work of this uh, gel coat on the grid. Inside here as well, you'll see that Patrick um, went ahead and chopped into this one. Uh, it's quite interesting to see inside the grid actually. To be honest, I'm planning to run a few wires and from that side to that side of the boat for some temperature sensors. So while he's got this apart, um, maybe I'll get the chance to just run those wires quickly just to make my life easier, but we'll see. I don't want to get in his way. You can see here as well, these are where the major cracks were in that uh, piece of grid here. And Patrick has gone ahead and uh, ground that down as much as uh, is necessary there to, to the depth where there's no more damage and then he can start laying glass on top of there. There was also a little bit of discussion on the through holes as well, what through holes that we should put back on the boat. A lot of people have different opinions on this actually and hands are fit plastic ones on this uh, that the seacocks fit onto. Plastic ones apparently are very good in salt water environments um, but some people say that they can be very weak as well if something um, bashes them very hard you could end up with a, a leak in the boat. So if the boat was to stay in the Baltic Sea it's not very salty up here and there's not that much corrosion but as we plan to do one day <laughs> is to start sailing around the world and reading up on this and everything and a lot of people are saying okay the bronze um, or the brass one or the other they tend to corrode a lot more in salt water so you're better off with the plastic through hulls. Um, I've got to speak to Nicholas about this a little bit he's the expert so I'm just going to get his opinion and decide later we'll see. Another thing that I mentioned to you last week is actually putting some holes in the grid here um, so that I can access inside the grid to remove that water. We've had a little discussion on this and Patrick can actually make a hole more or less this size and that's going to be perfect actually so I can actually see inside the grid with a little light um, just to see if there's any standing water there and I can remove it uh, very easy. That's also going to be a, a great little improvement for me. I know yeah, I may have OCD with this, but I, I hate standing water, even if it's only a little bit, you know. I like the bottom of the boat to be very dry so that there's no weird smells or there's no mold growing or it, it doesn't evaporate and keep the humidity up and yeah, I'm a little picky. One last upgrade that I've been thinking about doing here as well is putting a bigger bilge pump in because this little thing here, um, it can shift a fair bit of water there, but if you ever have a problem or ever have uh, a lot of water coming into the boat, you're going to want the best bilge pump that there is out there, at least in my opinion anyway. You want a bilge pump that will just shift water as fast as possible, you know. I mean, a good way of doing that is with a bucket, but if you can have it automatic so that you've got time to run around and start looking for where the leak's coming from or anything like that, um, I'd much rather have a good bilge pump in there and this on the screen now is the bilge pump that I've been looking at and I've been thinking about putting it just in front here um, so that you know if a lot like I say if a lot of water comes in I just want it to throw as much out as possible so that we can solve the problem. The only issue with this is that I've only got a certain number of through holes and where the water can go out right and thoughts that I've had before are 
putting a T connection on the existing bilge pump or one of the bilge pumps. Probably not a good idea though. Um, it's better to run a new pipe and get that just separated completely, which will involve putting in a new seacock on the outside and just running a new pipe. But again, I'm going to speak to Nicholas, the expert that's here to see um, whether I can put the bilge pump there and run uh, the pipe straight uh, underneath the bathroom there and uh, just drill a new through hull ready for that bilge pump. We'll see. It's just an idea at the moment. So in the last episode actually I mentioned the keel bolts. Now just looking at them, um, they're not in bad shape at all. Actually Patrick really protected these bolts against uh, any drilling pretty well. So what's going to happen once he's cleaned them all up and got all the bonding off them, he's going to check them all out and um, see whether we need new keel bolts or not. Now looking on the bottom of the boat here, uh, you can see the keel's completely removed now. It's, it's very strange being underneath a sailboat without a keel. It's like a, it's like a big whale underneath here. Or so. I don't know. It's it's weird. Anyway, under here, um, I didn't see this before actually, but if you can see that, uh, there's actually a crack uh, in the fiberglass going all the way back here, and you can see it very very faintly in the paintwork there. So what they're going to do is grind all this back and uh, put new glass on here and try and strengthen uh, this part of the hull behind the keel and um, yeah, repair the damage that was caused when the uh, keel was pushing up uh, into the hull and putting all that pressure there. Also it's interesting to see exactly how thick the hull is on a Hansa there. And I would say that's roughly about 10 millimeters. So far, I'm really happy with the way that the work is going. Everything seems so calculated and precise, and you can tell that there's a lot of experience in this place um, with fixing things like this. And it's so nice to be able to come down and uh, talk to the guys in a friendly way, and they'll, they'll explain to me exactly how everything's being fixed, why that's being done. Yeah, it's like a breath of fresh air compared to some of the experiences I've had with previous companies that I've dealt with in Sweden, that's for sure. Let's come back Friday and see what's happening. It's another day, Friday today, so let's go and see what Patrick's done up there again. Back on the boat, and unfortunately I just missed Patrick because I was a little bit late getting here today, you know. I have to keep up a full-time job as well, so it's kind of hard running two lives, right? But. Uh, Looks like Patrick has gone ahead and taken uh, this section now. Um, he's ground away these, this part of the hull and the tabs around the uh, grid on this side. And um, he's done underneath the kitchen as well. And you can access th that through the, through the dra drawer through the kitchen unit here. And looking at the footage on the GoPro and uh, from what I heard from Emil, it was an absolute pain in the backside. So I can understand that it takes a lot of time to get in here and work in funny angles and uh, do some backbreaking work. This part of the process, um, I would say, is not the easiest because the actual grinding work and the manual labor is pretty intensive. I mean, I've done sanding underneath the hull, that's pretty hard. I've done grinding as well in the back area when I was installing the anchomatic anchor and I've done the glass work and, and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty grueling work, but it's the grunt work, all of the grinding work and everything like that and the exploratory work and seeing what needs to be fixed. It's the, um, it's mainly the manual labor. What I'm looking forward to is the clever parts of this on how they're going to actually repair all the bits and pieces, right? This is the part of the grid here that needs to be the strongest part. So, like I said before, Patrick has cut a letterbox in the back of this so he can access this and he can cut a piece of fiberglass that will be laminated inside here and both uh, screwed and glassed in on the inside. So this part is gonna be super strong. And then in the other parts of this grid, um, he's actually gonna laminate on the inside as well, down to the hull, making it really, really strong, uh, which I'm looking forward to seeing. That's, that's gonna be fun. You can also see in here some additional damages um, to the furniture a grounding does. What I mean by that is that when a grounding happens, right, all the forces are coming up into this floor. So the whole floor tends to jump 
and cause a shock wave. Of course, the kitchen is sitting on top of the floor there, right? The kitchen unit's there. And you can see here that they've marked some damages around here because what tends to happen is um, the joints and the, the pieces of the kitchen can snap, all right? So some cosmetic work needs to be done there also. And you can see underneath the kitchen um, as well, I've just pulled out this piece of bonding here and um, it's basically like rock. There's no give in this at all. You know, it's not like a Cicaflex or anything like that. It just sets and it's really, really hard and quite brittle actually. The kitchen uh, unit has delaminated against the hole there. So some work needs to be done to um, get that strong again. You can see the mobile phone, state-of-the-art lighting equipment. It's an awesome accessory, especially around a boat. This hull is made of vinyl ester, actually. And what Plascard are, are doing here is actually testing whether their polyester resin will bond to this hull uh, really effectively. And if they've ground down enough for a good bond to happen, and like I said, whether the resin will bond to it really well. The good parts about working with polyester resin is the fact that you can do more at one time compared to epoxy. Some of the Hansas before were built with epoxy resin and that's where the E comes from at the end of the name. So if you see a Hansa 300E or 400E, um, it's because they were built in epoxy. Polyester resin, it's easier to work with and it's strong enough. It's more than strong enough for this uh, application. Um, and it goes better with the gel coat afterwards. It's easier to apply gel coat on. The other differences are between polyester resin and epoxy resin is that the polyester resin is actually cheaper. So for large areas to use polyester resin, it's actually more uh, cost effective. And polyester resin is stiffer than epoxy resin. Um, and that's exactly what you want when you're working around the keel area because you want the boat to be very stiff and uh, unflexible, really. And this is also important as well because once you start working with one, you can't just switch to the other. They won't bond together. Okay, another thing that he's been doing actually is starting to sand away the top of the keel here um, just to get a really good surface so that it can make a good bonding. Uh, back with the hull there and he will go slightly down the keel here and uh, Put about six to seven layers of epoxy primer on there just to seal everything back up again And then the keel will be ready to go on uh, Another thing he's been doing as well is just cleaning these keel bolts up I think the tool to do that is called a die. It's, it's usually called a tap. A tap is used to make the holes and then a die is used to make the uh, threads. In 95% of these cases, um, the keel bolts are actually saveable. As long as they're not nicked or anything like that, there's no reason to change the keel bolts. If they do need to be changed, um, they can be removed from the keel. All you do is just put on uh, two nuts here, and then you can wind the threads straight out of the keel, and then you can replace the bolts. But these are actually in pretty good shape. Most of the work over the last two weeks has been grinding and actually figuring out exactly what needs to be repaired. Over the next few weeks, I guess they'll start actually building it back up again and that's going to be really interesting how that's going to go and um, yeah, watching all the glass work going and, and, and the fiberglass and the materials and chemicals used. So stick around and uh, join me next week and we'll see how far we get. Thanks guys, take care, have a good week, speak to you next time.